Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Nefertima, for your thoughts and for taking us back to your childhood. Uh, for those of you who think uh, that we're about to do more singing, uh, no. Uh, although I would really love to do that. Uh, it is my honor this morning to bring you God's word, and I am happy to do so. So if you would go ahead on and turn to John chapter 4, we'll be there momentarily. I need to take just a few minutes to mention a few things. Um, the first being a personal announcement. Um, this Sunday at this congregation uh, from 4 to 6, and probably at other churches uh, around the metro area, is the first candy gathering for the children and their parents. Amen. And I just want to remind the parents and the children of the Steve Maxwell Baby Ruth candy gathering tax. <laughs> okay, there's no such thing, but... Boy, I wish there was. And if your child gets one of those little small baby Ruths and they want to bring it to the worship minister, he would not be upset about that. <laughs> that goes for you at home also. But in all seriousness, you'll hear a little bit more. We invite you to come back for Trunk or Treat, especially if you have children. It's a time of games and fun. And we would love to have you come back. Also, during this time of the year, um, I know... Uh, my son and I, Judah, I'm going to talk about him a little bit more in just a second. The first time when we go out to go to school and it's below 60 degrees, we enjoy that. Amen. But there are many people who um, are out. They don't have a home and they'll need a coat. And so our coat drive is about to start. You'll hear more information about that. And so I want to encourage you to do that. And then also, uh, there was a little small baseball game. That was played yesterday, and there may be one or two people that care about it. Amen. Yes. And I know we have people in here uh, who maybe your home is Houston, Texas, and we love you. We still love you. Uh, we're going to need you to remember where you live now, though, at least for the next few. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. This is a love first church, so. Uh. Make sure you vote for, uh, root for the Braves. Okay, and so we are uh, studying uh, the book of John, and we are looking at our, our sermon uh, series is entitled Gestures. And so I just want to take just a moment to say good morning. We're so thankful for you being here. If you're visiting with us and you are looking for a church home, uh, my prayer is that you have found that church home. And so we're so happy to have you here uh, with us this morning. I want to start off, uh, if you will, with a, with a story that's going to be in two parts. I'm going to tell the first part now, and then at the end of the sermon, I will wrap up with that story. This is a story uh, about one of my boys, my middle boy, Judah. And I want you to know, that as you hear this story, that I called Judah. I know he's in, he's in the house, but I, I still, I called him, and I said, Judah, would it be okay? Do I have your permission to tell this story? And he said, Okay, Dad. So, anyway, kind of like that, too. So, that ought to give you an indication about the story. My wife and I drive our boys to school. We always have their entire scholastic career. We love to do it. It's a time for us to be able to engage with them. And so, we take them to school and we pick them up. It's also uh, a chance for us, when you hear that message, when you get to the school, right, oh, what that means, right, all parents already know. That means I forgot something. Can you run back to the house, grab that, bring it back to the school? That's what that means. And so that also gives us a chance to do that. And so I was taking, it was my morning uh, to take Josiah and Judah. They go to Sandy Springs Charter uh, to take them to school. And so I did. And then the afternoon came, came time for me to pick them up. Pick up is simple. Um, when you drive, there's a car line, you drive. You uh, wait. The children are all out there on the sidewalk uh, ready to be picked up. And so you're, you drive up, your child gets in the car, and you take off. Uh, for the Maxwell pickup, the Maxwell 2 pickup at Sandy Springs, it's real simple. 99% uh, of the time, Josiah comes out first. Two to three minutes later, Judah comes out. That's just kind of how they roll. That's fine with Alicia and I. 
Anyway, I pulled up. There's also this one thing, you need to know this, right? When you pull up, if you uh, are, if a car in front of you, their children get in the car and then they leave, then they want you to pull up, right? That kind of keeps it moving, right? Those of you, who you, you know that. So when I pulled up, um, there were maybe four cars in front of me. Boom, Josiah comes, he gets in. How you doing, son? Fine, dad, cool. I always ask the same question, even though I know. Have you seen Judah? No, not yet. And so Josiah rolls his window down and sticks his head out to look back to see if he can see Judah. No Judah. Car in front of me leaves, I pull up. Three cars in front of me. No Judah. Car in front of me leaves, pulls up, two cars. All of a sudden, I'm at the front of the line, and it's 10 minutes later, and there's no Judah. Now, inside, I'm starting to change. My face, a smile is going away. Teacher outside the car kind of taps on my door. Can I help you? I said, I'm missing one child, Judah Maxwell. Right, and I say I have a little bit of joy in my voice. So she shouts out over the sea of children, Judah Maxwell. No Judah. Five minutes later, it's 15 minutes since I got there, and now I'm not happy. So I drive up into the parking lot, park my car, and I get out. Josiah's like, Dad, can I come with you? No. Because if I encounter Judah, I don't want you to see what I'm going to do. <laughs> so I get out and I walk on the sidewalk. And you have to walk right past the teacher who's helping the students get in their cars and all the other students. And she's so sweet. She goes, I still haven't seen Judah. And I said, don't you worry. I'll find him. Into the school I go. Part one of the story. We continue in our series entitled Gestures this morning, and the purpose of this series is to remind us of the life of giving, right, that John talks about in his gospel, a life of giving. One of the most famous verses in scripture, and you have heard our sister Nefertima already read it. I'm going to read it to you again. It cannot be read too many times in any worship service or gathering. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Because God gave his son, we have the opportunity for life. So, so far what we've learned is that gestures are signs that point to Jesus. Amen. Every once in a while you'll hear Don mention a website that I like to use, and he is correct, Blue Letter Bible. In Blue Letter Bible, we find that the word sign is used eight times in seven verses. And the word signs is used 11 times in 11 verses. And you'll remember, as I just said, that signs are gestures or miracles or things that Jesus did, right, to help people connect with him. And John talks about them because he wants us to connect with Jesus. In John's Gospels, these signs always have a surface or a personal meaning and then a deeper meaning to which the sign points. So essentially, there are two levels to the sign. So let's look at the story of the healing of the official son found in John chapter 4. I want you to turn there in your Bibles. If you haven't already, I want to read that story, and I will read, and if you will read along with me silently. The scripture says, after, two, after the two days, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had, a, had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they had also been there. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. 
When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Now, there's a few things about our text I want to point out to you as we uh, continue on in our lesson this morning. Jesus is coming to Galilee from Jerusalem where he participated in the Passover feast. And what you'll learn in John's gospel, and Don has mentioned a few times, is that we actually see Jesus travel back and forth between Galilee and Jerusalem. And I'm going to say more about that when we get to our Bible class. We also see that there are Galileans who had been in Jerusalem, and they were witnesses to the signs that Jesus had been performing. Right? You'll also remember that Jesus mentions that a man has no honor, or a person has no honor in their own hometown. And the Galileans, being in Jerusalem, watching and seeing what Jesus did, will have something to do with why they welcomed him, right? because Jesus is in his hometown. Another thing that I want to point out to you is Jesus has two lines in the entire story, right? Just two lines. They are, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe, right? And then the second uh, uh, line that he uses is, go your son will live. We have to remember that the official's son is sick. And the official is laser focused on the help he needs and the person who can give him the help. He is laser focused on the help he needs and who can help him. And then the other two things I want you to know is that Jesus does heal the man's son. But Jesus also heals the man and his family. Amen. What I want to encourage us to do with the few minutes that I have this morning is to look harder. I want us to look harder. I want us to look at three questions that will help us to do that. First question is, what do we see? What do we see? What do we see when we look at this text? What do we see when we look around the world? What do we see? Second question. What is actually there to see? Huh? What is actually there to see? And then the third question, what can help us see below the surface to where the sign or signs point? What can help us see below the surface to where the sign or signs point? Let's look at the first question, shall we? What do we see? I can right now transport my mind back to something that is very familiar. Okay, that's all I had to do. Is, it, is anybody in here? Are you back with me? Are you with me? Okay, you're with me. All right, you're with me. All right, let's jump into Oh, halfway through the film, halfway through the film. And listen, I'm talking about the animated one. They're both good, but I'm talking about the animated one. Okay, here we go. Two characters, Rafiki and Simba. Pool of water. Are you with me? Pool of water. Rafiki says, look down there. That's not my father. That's just my reflection. No. Look. Harder. And as Simba looks harder, you can see his reflection changes into who? Mufasa. That's right, his father. And then Rafiki says these words He lives in you. How many of us need to remember who lives in us? In our story, the official is singularly focused on his son. And who could blame this father? His son is so sick that he may die if things don't happen quick. 
So now let me ask you a few questions. What do you see when you observe our world today? What lenses do you use to view our world? What are the hot topics you try to avoid at all costs? The holidays are a bonus. Amen. The children get to gather candy. I will be gathering turkey and ham and dressing soon after that. But when you're sitting at your table, what are going to be the things that are off limits? Here's one thing I know. It is very important to Satan to dichotomize everything. In other words, to have us fighting and at each other's throat. That is Satan's plan. He is excellent at it, and that is exactly what he wants us to be doing. He wants us fighting over everything. I mean, he even wants us fighting over candy corn versus circus peanuts. Candy corn, obviously, is the right. Jesus prayed in John 17 that we all be one. But in today's climate, this seems like an almost an impossible mountain to climb. Everywhere we turn, there is division. I know it's easy for me to have tunnel vision at a time like this and to focus solely on myself. And so because of this, I personally have turned and will turn to Scripture in order to help me with that. I want to mention just three verses that I have been uh, turning to um, here recently. The first one is Psalm 119.11, where the scripture says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Another passage that I like is in Galatians chapter 5, starting at 13, where scripture says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then this last verse particularly speaks to me. In verse 15 it says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. And then Galatians chapter 6, 9 and 10. As a matter of fact, I have been grabbing a hold and hugging this verse tight since about midway through 2020. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Staying in God's word gives me better vision to see the things God wants me to see. I'm reminded to love my neighbor. I'm reminded that it is not helpful for me or to others for me to devour them with my words, with my actions, with my silence, amen, with my power, with my privilege. It's not helpful for me to do that. I'm reminded to hang in there and not give up on doing good to others, especially those who belong to the body of believers. What do we see? Second question, what is actually there to see? In our story, this man is talking to Jesus. And one of the benefits that we have of looking back or looking at Scripture is we can see from our point of view, right? We know what's going to happen because we've read the story. This man has no clue as he's in the story. But this man is talking to Jesus. Jesus is light. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of Man. Jesus is living water. Jesus is the bread of life. These are all things we know. This man is like, who can help heal my son? There's a song entitled Standing Right in Front of You that reminds me to do this very thing. Amazing song. The chorus at the end of it, uh, there's one last chorus. 
And it goes, he is standing right in front of you, showing love for open eyes to see. Jesus is standing right in front of you, standing there for he will always be. The Son of Man, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the way, the truth, the life, the victory. The entire song is an amazing song that reminds us to see Jesus who is always there. I must admit that often my concern for me blinds me to the things I need to notice that are right in front of me. And if I'm not careful, I can be like some of the people that we have encountered so far in our lessons. Right? Sometimes I'm like Mary, Jesus' mother. Oblivious. Oblivious to a better timing. Now, Jesus is obedient. He does not put his mother on front street, but he does say to her, my time has not yet come. And you know what she says? Do whatever he tells you. Right? Maybe I'm like the Jews in the temple, sitting at my table, selling my things. And I'm like, what sign can you give me? This is me talking to Jesus. What sign can you give me that proves you have the right to make me uncomfortable? Maybe I'm like the Jews. Oftentimes we picture ourselves when we see Jesus going into the temple, throwing over tables, we picture ourselves grabbing a table and turning it over too. Right? Probably more than likely we're sitting at a table rather than turning one over. Maybe I'm like the woman at the well where I say, well, then give me a drink of some of that water so I don't have to keep coming to this well to get a drink. Right? More often than I can admit, I'm just like the official in our story. Where Jesus says, if you guys, if you don't see a sign, you won't believe. And you know what I say? My son is sick. Please help my son. Question three. What can help us see below the surface to where the sign points? I want to suggest three things to help us look harder, to help us look deeper to where the sign points and not just the sign. Right? And here's a little clue. You actually just heard it. Hear those three things. First thing. Hide God's word in your heart. Amen. Something that can help us to look deeper is to hide God's word in our hearts. It can remind you that sometimes you do what you know you shouldn't. And sometimes you don't do what you know you should. It can remind you that the things of God should be written on your heart, talked about with your children, talked about with others you love, and even with people that you don't know. It can remind you that as believers, you belong to one another. Did you know that we belong to one another as believers? It can remind you that your brothers and sisters in Christ, listen to this one, your brothers and sisters in Christ have been told to come and point out your sin to you. If you agree, Cool. If you disagree, the Bible also has great instructions on how to handle it in a way that honors the both of you and gives God the glory. It can remind us that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we need to hide God's word in our heart. Second thing, look to love your neighbor and stop devouring one another. We need to look to love our neighbor and stop devouring one another. If you need a definition of neighbor, I'm going to ask you on your own time to look at Luke chapter 10 and the story of the Good Samaritan. 
Amen. God's created people are your neighbor. God's created people, that's all mankind, are your neighbor. Do you know that when we devour one another, we are carrying out Satan's plan? When we fight amongst each other and talk to each other any old kind of way, we are following Satan's plan. I believe in Scripture talks about him being a lying, seeking whom he may what? Yeah, okay, you with me, you with me. Now listen, it's not always easy, right, to love your neighbor and not devour them. I know when I feel wrong, I don't like it. And not only do I not like it, but I also want to do something about it. That's probably not you. You probably not like that. I have to remember that God loves them. God loves me. And God actually wants no one to perish. I have to remember my own sin. And I have to remember the fact that God gave his son for me. Now, I want to mention one more thing, right? And it, it happens to do with uh, what I've already mentioned where I said that your brothers and sisters have been asked to point out your sin to you. Okay, this one is difficult. Here we go. If someone says something to you and they raise their voice a little bit or it cuts a little deeper than you want to, that does not make them wrong. What, did you say that again? Did you say that again? Did you, did you say what you just said? Yeah, let, let me repeat it. If someone says something to you and they raise their voice a little bit or it hits you in a way and you don't feel comfortable, that does not mean that they have wronged you. And it also doesn't mean that they don't love you. Remember the first thing that I said about hiding Scripture, seeking Scripture? It'll help you with that, right? Sometimes we need some flip-over-table type love. Let me say it one more time. Sometimes we need, you need somebody to give you some flip-over-table type love. Do you think that Jesus is flipping over a table and he doesn't love the people whose tables he's flipping over? Absolutely not. He's flipping over tables because he loves them. But we don't like people flipping over our table. If somebody flips over our table, then they're rude. They don't love me. I don't have anything to hear from them. Sometimes we need, right, sometimes we need some opposed to your face type of love. Is, is the preacher saying that? Yes, I am. And if you don't think we need that kind of love, ask Peter. Because that's the kind of love he received from Paul. Scripture says in Galatians chapter 2 that Paul opposed Peter, how? To his face. Let me move on. The third thing is don't get tired of doing what's good. We're living in a time where people will dichotomize the way you look while you're just sitting somewhere breathing. We can't define people, and you have heard Don say this before, by their worst moment. You can't take your first interaction with somebody and that interaction not being good, and then you just label them and you don't give them a chance, you don't forgive them at all. Even if you believe someone is rude or insensitive or privileged or any other host of hot words today, you can still have hope for them. And if you can't do it on your own, and you can't, then you draw upon the Holy Spirit inside of you to give you the ability to issue to them God's hope. And then lastly, we have to build stamina to hang in there. To be able to hear words, the hot buzzwords of today, the controversial words, and not be so quick to run away, but listen and wait for an opportunity to inject with the power of the Holy Spirit some of Jesus' words into these situations. Amen? We have to find ways to encourage one another and have hard conversations. Well, 
as we end, we probably should finish that story that I started at the beginning, right? <laughs> I walked into that school. I had a mixture of irritated and worried and anger going on inside of me. Where in the world is Judah? I was thinking about reports I had heard just in the news or through email with maybe students fighting or maybe students bringing things to school that they shouldn't have. You understand what I'm saying? As a parent, everything starts jumping into your head. Plus, I still didn't know where Judah was. So I walked into the office, and some nice person said, can I help you? Right? I calmed myself down again. I'm looking for Judah Maxwell. She says, well, let me call down to the room where he is. Bloop, bloop, bloop on the computer and looked up, saw where he was, called down there. I even forget the teacher's name. Hello, is Judah there? Yes, he is. I'll send him right up immediately. Oh, my worry just it evaporated from my body. But then I thought to myself, I still want to kill him. And if you all know Judah, wouldn't you know he just came up the hall and just about he's just happy as he could be. And he got, he got up to me and he saw my face. And then he did what a thousand children have done. Here's what he said. What? Now. Truth be told, as soon as I saw him, I wanted to run up to him and give him a big old hug. Right. But <clears throat> whether it's good parenting or not, and true, I mean, I, just, I might as well be honest with you. I didn't smile at him. When we walked all the way out to the car, I didn't say nothing. I was just, nope. And then we got to the car, and he, his smile was gone at this point. He's th thinking to himself, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And I just said to him, Judah. I was worried about you, man. I just didn't know where you were. I want to take us back to the story of the father when he encountered Jesus. And he said, please help me with my son. And Jesus says, unless you people see a miracle, you won't believe. And the man's response was, hurry up, man. My son is dying. Come to find out, all that happened was that Judah just didn't hear the teacher when she dismissed the students, the car riders. No big deal. Now, had I thought about it, no one had called me, and the school where the boys go is great at doing that, right? Judah hadn't changed plans. And let me tell you guys something. I love all three of my boys, and they are all excellent at letting us know when they're going to change the plans. As a matter of fact, they call to make sure we're on the same page. So if I had thought about it a little bit, then I wouldn't have wearied. In closing, I want to say this. In verse 53 of John chapter 4, the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. The father realized he believed his household believed. If we can look a little bit harder, we can see that the blessings in our lives point to Jesus. If we can look a little bit harder, we can see that our healing can make it possible for others to believe. If we can look a little harder, we won't always need a miracle or a gesture or a sign to know that Jesus is the answer for the world today. Amen? Let's have the band come up. Thank you.